Chapter 17 of The Inner Shrine by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 17 During the summer that followed these events, Derek Prune set himself the task of stamping the memory and influence of Diane Evelith out of his life. His sense of duty combined with his feelings of self-respect in making the attempt. In reflecting on his last interview with her, he saw the weakness of the stand he had taken in it, recoiling from so unworthy a position with natural reaction. To have been in love at all at his age struck him as humiliation enough. But to have been in love with that sort of woman came very near mental malady. He said, that sort of woman because the vagueness of the term gave scope to the bitterness of resentment with which he tried to overwhelm her. It enabled him to create some such paradise of pain as that into which the souls of Othello and Desdemona might have gone together. Had he been a moor of Venice, he would doubtless have smothered her with a pillow. But being a New York banker, he could only try to slay the image, whose eyes and voice had never haunted him so persistently as now. In his rage of suffering, he was as little able to take a reasoned view of the situation as the maddened bull in the arena to appraise the skill of his tormentors. When in the middle of May he had retired to Rhinefields, it was with the intention of laying waste all that Diane had left behind in the course of her brief passage through his life. The process being easier in the exterior phases of existence than in the more secret and remote, he determined to work from the outside inward. Wherever anything reminded him of her, he erased, destroyed, or removed it. All that she had changed within the house, he put back into the state in which it was before she came. Where he had followed her suggestions about the grounds and gardens, he reversed the orders. Taken as outward and visible signs of the inward and spiritual change he was trying to create within himself, these childish acts gave him a passionate satisfaction. In a short time, he boasted to himself, he would have obliterated all trace of her presence. And so he came, in time, to giving his attention to Dorothea. She too bore the impress of Diane, and as she bore it more markedly than the inanimate things around, it caused him the greater pain. He could forbid her to hold intercourse with Diane and to speak of her, but he could not control the blending of French and Irish intonations her voice had caught or the gestures into which she slipped through youth's mimetic instinct. In happier days he had been amused to note the degree to which Dorothea had become the unconscious copy of Diane. But now this constant reproduction of her ways was torture. Telling himself that it was not the child's fault, he bore it at first with what self-restraint he could. But, as solitude encouraged brooding thoughts, he found, as the summer wore on, that his stock of patience was running low. There were times when some charged sentence or imitated bit of mannerism on Dorothea's part almost drew from him that which in tragedy would be a cry, but which in our smaller life becomes the hasty or exasperated word. In these circumstances, the explosion was bound to come. And one day it produced itself unexpectedly and about nothing. Thinking of it afterward, Derek was unable to say why it should have taken place then more than at any other time. He was standing on the lawn, noting with savage complacency that the bit by which he had enlarged it at Diane's prompting had grown up again in luxuriant grass, when Dorothea descended the steps of the Georgian brick house behind him. "'Would you be after wanting me today?' she called out, using the Irish expression Diane affected in moments of fun. "'Dorothea!' cried sharply, wheeling round at her. Drop that idiotic way of speaking. If you think it's amusing, you're mistaken. You can't even do it properly. The words were no sooner out than he regretted them, but it was too late to, to take them back. Moreover, when a man, nervously suffering, has once wounded the feeling of one he loves, it is not infrequently his instinct to go on and wound them again. We have enough of that sort of language from the servants and the stable boys. Be good enough in future to use your mother tongue. Standing where his words had stopped her a few yards away, she looked up at him with the clear gaze of astonishment. And the slight shrug of the shoulders before she spoke was also a trick caught from Diane, 
are not calculated to allay his annoyance. Very well, father, she answered, with the quiet indicating judgment held reserve. I won't do it again. I only meant to ask you if you want me for anything in particular today. Otherwise I shall go over and lunch at the Thoroughgoods. The Thoroughgoods again? Can't you get through a day without going there? I suppose I could if it was necessary, but it isn't. I think it is. You do well not to wear out your welcome anywhere. I'm not afraid of that. Then I am, so you'd better stay at home. He wheeled from her as sharply as he had turned to confront her, striding off toward a wild border, where he tried to conceal the extent to which he was ashamed of his ill temper, by pretending to be engrossed in the efforts of a bee to work its way into a blue cowl of monkshood. When he looked round again, she was still standing where he had left her, her eyes clouded by an expression of wondering pain that smote him to the heart. Had he possessed a sufficient mastery of himself, he would have gone back and begged her pardon and sent her away to enjoy herself. It was what he wanted to do, but the tension of his nerves seemed to get relief from the innocent thing's suffering. The very fact that her pretty little face was set with his own obstinacy of self-will, while behind it her spirit was rising against this capricious tyranny, goaded him into persistence. He remembered how often Diane had told him that Dorothea could be neither led nor driven, she could only be managed. But he would show Diane, he would show himself, that she could be both driven and led, and that management should go the way of the wall fruit and the roses. As, recrossing the lawn, he made as though he would pass her without further words, he was an excellent illustration of the degree to which the adult man of the world, capable of taking an important part among his fellow men, can be at times nothing but an overgrown infant. It was not surprising, however, that Dorothea should not see this aspect of his personality, or look upon his commands as other than those of an unreasonable despotism. Father, she said, I can't go on living like this. Living like what? Living as we've lived all this summer. What's the matter with the summer? It's like any other summer, isn't it? The summer may be like any other summer, but you're not like yourself. I do everything I can to please you, but... You didn't do anything to please me but what you're told. I always do what I'm told, when you tell me, but you only tell me by fits and starts. Then I tell you now, you're not to go to the Thoroughgoods. But they expect me. I said I'd go to lunch. They'll think it very strange if I don't. They'll think what they please. It's enough for you to know what I think. But that's just what I don't know. Ever since Diane went away, stop that. I've forbidden you to speak. But you can't forbid me to think, and I think till I'm utterly bewildered. You don't explain anything to me. You haven't even told me why she went away. If I ask a question, you won't answer it. What's necessary for you to know, you can depend on me to tell you. Anything I don't explain to you, you may dismiss from your mind. But that's not reasonable, father. It's not possible. If you want me to obey you, I must know what I'm doing. Because I don't know what I'm doing, I haven't... You haven't obeyed me? he asked quickly. Not entirely. I meant to tell you when an occasion offered, so I might as well do it now. I've written to Diane. You've... He strode up to her and caught her by the arm. It was not strange that she should take the curious light in his face for that of anger, but a more experienced observer would have seen that two distinct emotions crowded on each other. I've written to her twice, Dorothy repeated defiantly as he held her arm. She didn't reply to me. But I wrote. What for? To tell her that I loved her. That no trouble should keep me from loving her, no matter what it was. He released her arm, stepping back from her again, surveying her with an admiration he tried to conceal under a scowling brow. The rigidity of her attitude, the lift of her head, the set of her lips, the directness of her glance, suggested not merely rebellion against his will, but the assertion of her own. It occurred to him that he could not break her little body to pieces before he could force her to yield. And in his pride in this temperament, so like his own, he almost uttered the cry of brava that hung on his lips. He might have done so if Dorothea had not found it a convenient moment at which to make all her confessions at once and have them off her mind. It was best to do it, she thought, now that her courage was up. And father, she went on, it may be a good opportunity to tell you something else. I've decided to marry Mr. Wappinger. 
During the brief silence that followed this announcement, he had time to throw the blame for it upon Diane, using the fact as one more argument against her. Had she taken his suggestions at the beginning and suppressed the Wappinger acquaintance, this distressing folly would have received a definite check. As it was, the odium of putting a stop to it, which must now fall on him, was but an additional part of the penalty he had to pay for ever having known her. So be it. He would make good the uttermost farthing. In doing it, he had the same sort of frenzied satisfaction as in defacing Diana's image in his heart. You shall not, he said at last. I don't understand how you're going to stop me. I must ask you to be patient and see. You can make a beginning today by staying at home from the Thoroughgoods. That will be enough for the minute. Fearing to look any longer into her indignant eyes, he passed on towards the stables. For some minutes she stood still where he left her, while the collie gazed up at her with twitching tail and questioning regard, as though to ask the meaning of this futile hesitation. But when at last she turned slowly and re-entered the house, one would have said that the dainty rogue in porcelain had been transformed into an intensely modern little creature made of steel. She did not go to the Thoroughgoods that day, nor was any further reference made to the discussion of the morning. Compunction having succeeded irritation, with the rapidity not uncommon to men of his character, Derrick was already seeking some way of reaching his end by gentler means, when a new move on Dorothea's part exasperated him still further. As he was about to sit down to his luncheon on the following day, the butler made the announcement that Miss Prune had asked him to inform her father that she had driven over in the pony cart to Mrs. Thoroughgood's and would not be home till late in the afternoon. He was not in the house when she returned, and at dinner he refrained from conversation till the servants had left the room. So, it's war, he said, then speaking in a casual tone and toying with his wine glass. I hope not, father, she answered promptly, making no pretense not to understand him. It takes two to make a quarrel, and... And you wouldn't be one? I was going to say that I hoped you wouldn't be. But you yourself would fight? I should have to. I'm fighting for liberty, which is always an honourable motive. You're fighting to take it away from me. Which is a dishonourable motive. Very well. I must accept that imputation as best I may, and still go on. Oh, well, then it is war. You mean to make it so? I mean to do my duty. He may call your rebellion against it what you like. I'm not accustomed to, to rebel, she said with significant quietness. Only people who feel themselves weak do that. And are you so strong? I'm very strong. I don't want to measure my strength against yours, father. But if you insist on measuring yours against mine, I, I ought to warn you. Thank you. It's in the light of a warning that I view your action today. You probably went to meet Mr. Wappinger. In saying this, his bow was drawn so entirely at a venture that he was astonished at the skill with which he hit the mark. I did. He pushed back his chair, half rose, sat down again, poured out a glass of masala, drank it thirstily, and looked at her a second or two in helpless distress before finding words. And you talk of honourable motives. My motive was entirely honourable. I went to explain to him that I couldn't see him any more, just now. While you were about it, you might as well have said neither just now nor at any other time. She was silent. Do you hear? Yes, I hear, father. And you understand? I understand what you mean. And you promise me that it shall be so? No, father. You say that deliberately? Remember, I'm asking you an important question, and you're giving me an equally important reply. I recognise that, but I can't give you any other answer. We'll see. He pushed back his chair again and rose. He had already crossed the room when, a new thought occurring to him, he turned at the door. At least I presume I may count on you not to see this young man again without telling me. Not without telling you. Afterward. I couldn't undertake more than that. Huh, he ejaculated, before passing out. Then I must take active measures. It was easier, however, to talk about active measures than to devise them. While Dorothea was sobbing with her elbows on the dining-room table and her face buried in her hands, 
he was pacing his room in search of desperate remedies. It was a case in which his mind turned instinctively to Diane for help. But in the very act of doing so, he was confronted by her theories as to Dorothea's need of diplomatic guidance. For that, he told himself, the time was past. The event had proved how impotent mere management was to control her, and justified his own preference for force. Before she went to bed that night, Dorothea was summoned to her father's presence to receive the commands which should regulate her conduct towards the young man Wappinger. They could have been summed up in the statement that she must know him no more. She was not only never to see him, or write to him, or communicate with him, by direct or indirect means. As far as he could command it, she was not to think of him, or remember his name. His measures grew more drastic in proportion as he gave them utterance, until he himself became aware that they would be difficult to fulfil. I will not attempt to extract a promise from you, he was prudent enough to say in conclusion, that you will carry out my wishes, because I know you would never bring on me the unhappiness that would spring from disobedience. It's hardly fair, father, to say that, she replied firmly. In war, no one should shrink from the misfortunes of war. That means then that you defy me? She was calmer than he, as she made her reply. It doesn't mean that I defy you. I love you too much to put either you or myself in such an odious position as that. But it does mean that one day, sooner or later, I shall marry Mr. Wappinger. He looked at her with a bitter smile. I admire your frankness, Dorothea, he said after a brief pause, and I shall do my best to imitate it. If it's to be war, we shall at least fight in the open. I know what you intend to do, and you know that I mean to circumvent you. The position on both sides being so pleasantly clear, you may come and kiss me good night. During the process of the stiff little embrace that followed, it was as difficult for her not to fling herself sobbing on his breast as for him not to seize her in his arms. But each maintained the restraint inspired by the justice of their respective causes. When she had closed the door behind her, he stood for a long time, musing. That his thoughts were not altogether tragic became manifest as his brow cleared, and the ghost of a smile, this time without bitterness, hovered about his lips. Suddenly he slapped his leg like a man who has made a discovery. By gad, he whispered half aloud, when all is said and done, she knows how to play the game. End of chapter 17《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》《ハッピーナイト》The first few weeks of pallor and silence having passed, she resumed her accustomed ways, and, as far as he could tell, grew cheerful. Always having credited her with common sense, he was pleased now to see her make use of it in a way of which few girls of nineteen would have been capable. She accepted his surveillance with so much docility that by the time they returned to town in the autumn, he was able to congratulate himself on his success. On her part, Dorothea carried out his instructions to the letter. Notwithstanding the opening of the season and the renewal of the usual gaieties, she lived quietly, accepting few invitations and rarely going into society at all, except under her father's wing. On those accidental occasions when Carly Wappinger came within their range of vision, it was only as a distant ship drifts into sight at sea to drift silently away again. If Dorothea perceived him, she gave no sign. It was clear to Derrick that her spurt of rebellion was over, and that her little experience had done her no harm. The name of Wappinger being tacitly ignored between them, he could only express his pleasure in the results he had achieved by an extravagant increase of Dorothea's allowance and gifts of inappropriate jewels. It would have taken a more weather-wise person than he to guess that behind this domestic calm the storm was brewing. The first intuition of threatening events came to Mrs. Wappinger. I've seen nothing and heard nothing, 
she declared in her emphatic way to Diane. But I know something is going on. That was in September. They sat in the shade of the cool, flag-paved pergola at Waterwild, Mrs. Wappinger's place on Long Island. The tea table stood between them, and they lounged in wicker chairs. Framed by marble pillars and festooned from above by vines drooping from the roof, there was a view of terraced lawns descending towards the sea. Between the slightly overcrowded urns and statues, there were bright dashes of colour, here of dahlias in full bloom, there of reddening garlands of Amphinopsis or Virginia creeper. It was what Mrs. Wappinger called an off-day, otherwise she would not have had a Diane at Waterwild. In her loyalty toward the deserted woman, she seized those opportunities when Carly was away, and she was certain of having no other guests, to have the poor thing down for the day and give her a good meal. Not that people occupied themselves with Diane or her affairs. Her place in the hurrying, scrambling social throng had been so unobtrusive that now that she had no longer filled it, she was easily forgotten. Among the few who paid her the tribute of recollection, there was a generally received impression that Derek Prune, having discovered her relations with the Marquis de Pionville, relations which, so they said, had been well known in Paris in the days when she was still someone, had dismissed her from her position in his household. That was natural enough, and there was no further reason for remembering her. Having disappeared into the limbo of the unfortunate, she was as far beyond the mental range of those who retained their blessings as souls that have passed are out of sight of men and women who still walk the earth. For this very reason she called out in Mrs. Wappinger that motherly good nature which was only partially warped by the ambition for social success. On more than one of her off days she had lured Diane out of her refuge in University Place, treating her with all the kindness she could bestow, without causing disparaging comment upon herself. On the present occasion she was the more desirous of her company because of the fact that, as she expressed it herself, she had sniffed something going on. As I tell you, she repeated, I've heard nothing and seen nothing. I've just sniffed it. If you'd have asked me how, I couldn't explain it to you any more than I can say how I get the scent of this climbing heliotrope. But I do get it, and I do know something is in the wind, more than what is told to you and I. One can only hope that it will be nothing foolish, Diane murmured guardedly. It will be something foolish, Mrs. Wappinger declared, and you may take my word for it. Derek Prune can't arrogate to himself the powers of the Lord above any more than we can. If he thinks he can stop young blood from running, he'll find out he's wrong. It was the first mention of his name that Diane had heard in many weeks, and at the sound her hand trembled in such a way that she was obliged to put down untasted the cup she had half raised to her lips. He's not an unkind man, she found voice to say. He's only a mistaken one. He has one of those natures capable of dealing magnificently with great affairs, but helpless in the trivial matters of every day. He's like the people who see well at a distance, but become confused of the objects right under their eyes. And the farther you keep away from that man, the better the view he'll take of you. It's what I'd say to Carly if he asked for my advice. Does that mean, Diane ventured to inquire, that you don't want him to marry Dorothea? I certainly do not. If there were no other reason, she's the sort of girl to make me put one foot into the grave, whether I want to or no. And it stands to reason that I don't want to be squelched one hour before my time. Naturally. But I fancy you'd find her a sweeter girl than you might suppose. So she may be, dear. But I've spent too much money on Carly to wish to see him force his way into a family where he isn't wanted. This was the text of Mrs. Wappinger's discourse, not only on the present occasion, but on the subsequent off days when Diane was induced to visit Waterwild. Whatever is going on, Reggie Bradford's in it, she confided to Diane some few weeks later. Is that the fat young man with the big laugh? Yes, and one of the greatest catches in New York. Harley tells me he's wild about Madeline Grimston, and I can see for myself that Mrs. Bayford is playing him against that Frenchman. She'll get the title if she can, but if not, she'll fall back on the money. It's a pretty safe alternative, Diane smiled, making an effort to speak without betraying her feelings. Reggie is a good-natured boy, Mrs. Wappinger pursued, but a regular water-pipe. 
If you want to get anything out of him, you've only got to turn the faucet. It's just as well that he is, because whatever Carly is up to, Reggie knows. And what Reggie knows, Barry and Grimston knows. If ever you see her. Oh, but I don't, not now. That's a pity. If you did, you could pump her. I'm afraid I'm not much good at that sort of thing. Well, I am when I get a chance. I'm bound to find out somehow. There are more ways of killing a cat than by giving it poison. A few weeks later still, Mrs. Wappinger informed Diane that Dorothea Prune was not happy. The Thuragoods told the Louds, she explained, and the Louds told me. Her father thinks she's given in to him, but she hasn't, not an inch. He keeps her like a jailer, and she acts like a convict, always with an eye open for some way of escape. That man no more understands women than he does making pie. I've always noticed that the really strong men really do. There's almost invariably something petty about a man to whom a woman isn't a puzzle and a mystery. If it comes to a puzzle and a mystery, I don't know where you'd find a greater one than Derek Prune himself, after the way he's acted and treated people. Diane Flush had kept her emotions sufficiently under control to be able to follow her usual plan of straightforward speaking. If you mean me, Mrs. Watbinger, I wanted to say that Mr. Prune has done nothing for which I can blame him. He was placed in a situation with which only a very subtle intelligence could have dealt, and I respect him the more for not having had it. It's generally the man who is most competent in his own domain who is most likely to blunder when he gets into the woman's. And I, for one, would rather have him do it. I've had to suffer because of it, and so has Dorothea. And yet that doesn't make me like it less. No, I dare say not, Mrs. Wappinger responded sympathetically. Mr. Wappinger himself was just such a man as that. He put through a deal that would make Wall Street shiver. But he understood my woman's nature, just about as much as old Tiger there, wagging his tail on the grass, follows the styles in bonnets. Only I'll tell you what, Mrs. Eglith, it's for men like that that God created sensible, capable wives like you and me, and they ought to have them. This scene admitting of little discussion, Diane did not pursue it. But she went away from Waterwild with a deepened sense of Derrick's need of her, as well as of Dorothea's. She could so easily have helped them both that the enforced impotence was a new element in her pain. To walk the town in search of work to which she was little suited, when that which no one but herself could accomplish had to remain undone, became, during the next few weeks, the most intolerable part of the irony of circumstance. The wifely, the maternal qualities of her being, of which she had never been strongly conscious till of late, awoke in response to the need that drew them forth, only to be blighted by denial. The inactivity was the harder to endure because of the fact that, as autumn passed into early winter, there came a period when all her little world seemed to have dropped her out of sight. There were no more off days at Waterwild and Miss Lucilla's occasional letters from Newport ceased. Between her mother-in-law and herself, after a few painful attempts at intercourse, there had fallen an equally painful silence. Even her two or three pupils fell away. From the papers she learned that one or another of those for whom she cared was back in town again. She walked in the chief thoroughfares in the hope of meeting some of them, but chance refused to favour her. In the dusk of the early descending November and December twilights, she passed their houses, watching the warm glow of the lights within, against which, now and then, a shadow that she could almost recognise would pass by. She could have entered at Miss Lucilla's door, or Mrs. Wappinger's, but a strange shyness, the shyness of the unfortunate, had taken hold of her, and she held back. In the meantime, she was free to watch, with sad eyes and sadder spirit, the great city, reversing the processes of nature, awaken from the torpor of the genial months into its winter life. No one knew better than herself that thrill of excited energy with which those born with the city instinct return from the acquired taste for mountain, seaside and farm to enter once more the maze of purely human relationships. It was a moment with which her own active nature was in sympathy. She liked to see the blinds being raised in the houses and the barricading doors taken down. She liked to see the vehicles begin to crowd one another in the streets 
and the pedestrians on the pavement wear a brisker air. She liked to see the shop windows brighten with colour, and the great public gathering spots let in and let out their throngs. She responded to the quickening animation with the spontaneity of one all ready to take her part, till the thought came that a part had been refused to her. It was with a curious sensation of being outside the range of human activities that, during those days of timid, futile, looking for employment, she roamed the busy thoroughfares of New York. As time passed, she ceased to think much about her need of sympathetic fellowship in her anxiety to get work. She wrote advertisements and answered them. She applied at schools and offices and shops. She came down to seeking any humble drudgery which would give her the chance to live. It was not until one day in early December that the last flicker of her hope went out. Chance had made her pass at midday along the pavement opposite one of the great restaurants. Lifting her eyes instinctively towards the group of well-dressed people on the steps, she saw that Mrs. Bayford and Marian Grimston were going in, accompanied by Reggie Bradford and the Marquis de Bionville. She had heard little or nothing of them during the last four empty months, but it was plain now that the lovers were agreed and her own cause abandoned. Up to this moment, she had not realised how tenaciously she had clung to the belief that the proud, high-souled girl would yet see justice done her, and now she had deserted her like the rest. For the first time during her years of struggle, she felt absolutely beaten, beaten so thoroughly that it would be useless to renew the fight. She'd been on her way to see a lady who had advertised for a nursery governess, but she had no strength left with which to face the interview. In the winter garden of the restaurant, Mrs. Bayford was purring to her guests. Reggie Bradford was whispering to Miss Grimston, and the Marquis de Bienville was ordering the wines, while Diane was wandering blindly back to the poor little room she called her home, there to lie down and allow her heart to break. But hearts do not break at the command of those who own them, and when she had moaned away the worst of her pain, she fell asleep. When she awoke it was already growing dark, and the knocking at her door, which roused her, was like a call from the peace of dreams to the desolation of reality. When she turned on the night, she received from the hands of the waiting servant that which had become a most rare visitant in the blackness of her life, a note. The address was in a sprawling hand which she recognised. What was written within was more sprawling still. For heaven's sake, come to me at once. I expect it has happened and I don't know what to do. The motor will wait and bring you. Clara Hoppinger. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 of The Inner Shrine by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 19. As Diane entered, Mrs. Wappinger, dishevelled and distraught, was standing in the hall, a slip of yellow paper in her hand. Oh, my dear, I'm so glad you've come. I'm just about crazy. Read this. Diane took the paper and read it. D and I are to be married tonight. Be ready to receive us tomorrow. Kai. When did this come? Diane asked quickly. About half an hour ago. I sent for you at once. I see it's dated from Lakefield. Where's that? Mrs. Wappinger explained that Lakefield was a small winter health resort some two hours by train from New York. She and Carly had stayed there, more than once, at the Bay Tree Inn. He would naturally go to the same hotel, only when she had telephoned to it a few minutes ago, she could find no one of the name in residence. Under the circumstances, Diane suggested, he would probably not give his name at all. There followed a few minutes of silent reflection, during which Mrs. Wappinger gazed at Diane in the half-tearful helplessness of one not used to coping with unusual situations. "'Won't you come and sit down?' she asked with a sudden realisation that they were still standing beneath the light in the hall. No, Diane answered with decision. It isn't worth while. May I have the motor for an hour or so? Why, certainly, but where are you going? I am going first to Miss Prunes, and afterwards to Lakefield. To Lakefield? Then I'll go with you. We could go in the car. Diane 
negative to both suggestions. The motor might break down, or the chauffeur might lose his way. The train would be safer. If anyone went with her, it would have to be Mr. Prune. But don't go to bed, she added, or at least have someone to answer the telephone, for I'll ring you up as soon as I have news for you. God bless you, dear, Mrs. Wappinger murmured. I know you'll do your best for me, and them. Keep the auto as long as you like, and if you decide to go down on it, just say so to La Porte. But Diane seemed to hesitate before going. A flush came into her cheek, and she twisted her fingers in embarrassment. I wonder, she called it, if, if you could let me have a little money. I, I shall need some, and I, and I haven't any. Oh, my dear, my poor dear. Mrs. Wappinger bustled away, crumpling the notes she found at her desk into a little ball, which she forced into Diane's hand. To forestall thanks, she thrust her towards the door, accompanying her down the steps, and kissing her as she entered the automobile. Why, oh, bless me hard if you ain't the madam. This outburst was a professional solecism on the part of Fulton, the English butler, at Derrick Prunes, but it was wrung from him in sheer joy at Diane's unexpected appearance. You'll excuse me, ma'am, continued, recapturing his air of decorum, but I fair couldn't help it. We'll be awful pleased to see you, ma'am, if I may make so bold as to say it, right down to the cat. It hasn't been the same house since you went away, ma'am, and me and Mr. Simmons have said so time and time again. You'll excuse me, ma'am, but you're very kind, Fulton, and, and so is Simmons, but, but I'm in a great hurry now. Is Mr. Prune at home? Why, no, he ain't, ma'am, and that's a fact. He, he's to die now. Where? Oh, I couldn't tell you that, ma'am. But perhaps Mr. Simmons would know. He took Mr. Prune's evening clothes to the bank and he was to change there. If you wait a minute, ma'am, I'll ask him. But when Simmons came, he could only give the information that his master was going to a sort of business banquet at one of the great restaurants or hotels. Moreover, Miss Dorothea had gone out, saying that she would not be home to dinner. Then I must write a note, Diane said, with that air of natural authority which had seemed almost lost from her manner. Will you, Fulton, be good enough to bring me a, a glass of wine and, and a few biscuits while I write? I must ask you, Simmons, for a, a railway guide. In Derrick's own room, she sat down at the desk where, six months ago, she had arranged his letters on the night when he had returned from South America. She had no time to indulge in memories, but a tremor shot through her frame as she took up the pen and wrote on a sheet of paper which she had already headed with a date. I have bad news for you but I hope I may be in time to keep it from being worse. I have reason to think that Dorothy has gone to Lakefield to be married there to Carly Wappinger. Should there be any mistake, you will forgive me for disturbing you, but I think it well to be prepared for extreme possibilities. I am therefore going to Lakefield now, at once. A train at 7.15 will get there a little after nine. There are other trains through the evening, the latest being at five minutes after ten. Should this reach you in time to enable you to take one of them, you will be wise to do so. But in case it may be too late, you may count on me to do all that can be done. Let someone be ready to answer the telephone all night. I shall communicate with the house from the Bay Tree Inn. I must ask you again to forgive me if I am interfering rashly in your affairs, but you can understand that I have no time to take counsel or reflect. Diane Evelyn. Having made a copy of this letter, she called Simmons and Fulton and gave them their instructions. There had been an accident, she said, of which she had been able to get only imperfect information, but it seemed possible that Miss Dorothea was involved in it. She herself was hurrying to Lakefield, and it would be Simmons' task to find Mr. Prune in time for him to catch the 10-5 train at latest. He was to pack two valises with all that Mr. Prune could require for a change. He was to take one of the two letters and one of the two valises and go from place to place until he tracked his master down. Fulton was to say nothing to alarm the other servants, merely informing Miss Dorothea's maid that the young lady was absent for the night and that Mrs. Eagles was with her. He would take charge of the second letter and the second valise in case Mr. Prune should return to the house before Simmons could find him. The important charge of the telephone was also to be in Fulton's trust, and he was to answer all calls through the night. In concluding her directions, Diane acknowledged her relief in having two lieutenants on whose silence, energy and tact she could so thoroughly depend. She committed the matter to their hands not merely as to Mr. Prune's butler and valet, but as to his trusted friends, and in that capacity she was sure they would do their duty and hold their tongues. In a similar spirit, when she arrived, about half-past nine, at the Bay Tree Inn, 
she asked for the manager and took him into her confidence. A runaway marriage, she informed him, had been planned to take place that very night at Lakefield, and she had come there as the companion and friend of a motherless girl, her object being to postpone the ceremony. The manager listened with sympathy and promised his help. As a matter of fact, a gentleman had arrived, driving his own motor, that very afternoon. He had put the machine in the garage and taken a room, but had not yet registered. Their season having scarcely begun and the hotel being empty, they were somewhat careless about such formalities. He could only say that the young man was tall, fair and slender, and seemed to be a person of means. He believed, too, that at this very minute he was smoking on the terrace before the door. If Diane had not come up by another way, she must have met him. She could step out on the terrace and see for herself whether it was the person she was looking for or not. Being tolerably sure of that already, Diane preferred to complete her arrangements first. She would ask for a room as near as possible to the main door of the hotel, so that when the young lady arrived she could be ushered directly into it. Fortunately, the establishment was able to offer her exactly what she required, one of the invalid suites which were a special feature of the house, a little sitting-room and bedroom for the use of persons whose infirmities made a long walk between their own apartments and the sun parlour inadvisable. Having inspected and accepted it, Diane bathed her face and smoothed her hair, after which she stepped out to confront Mr. Woppinger. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The Inner Shrine by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 20 She saw him at the end of the terrace, peering through the moonlight down the driveway. She did not go forward to meet him, but waited until he turned in her direction. She knew that, at a distance, and especially at night, her own figure might seem not unlike Dorothea's, and calculated on that effect. She divined his state of astonishment on catching sight of her by the abrupt jerk of his head and the way in which he half threw up his hands. When he began coming forward, it was with a slow, interrogative movement, as though he were asking how she had come there in disregard of their preconcerted signals. Some exclamation was already on his lips when, by the light streaming from the windows of the hotel, he saw his mistake and paused. "'Good evening, Mr. Wappinger. What an extraordinary meeting! Priding himself on his worldly wisdom, Cardi Wappinger never allowed himself to be caught by any trick of feminine finesse. On the present occasion he stood stock still and silent, eyeing Diane as a bird eyes a trap before hopping into it. Though he knew her as a friend to Dorothea and himself, he knew her as a subtle friend, hiding under her sympathy many of those kindly devices which experience keeps to foil the young. He did not complain of her for that, finding it legitimate that she should avail herself of what he called the stock-in-trade of a chaperone, while it had often amused him to outwit her. But now it was a matter of Greek meeting Greek, and she must be given to understand that he was the stronger. How she had discovered their plans he did not stop to think, but he must make it plain to her that he was not duped into ascribing her presence at Lakefield to an accident. Is it an extraordinary meeting, Mrs. Evelyn, for you? No, not for me, Diane replied readily. I only thought it might be for you. Then I'll admit that it is. But I hoped, too, she continued, moving a little nearer to him, that my coming might be in the way of a pleasant surprise. Oh, yes, certainly, very pleasant, very pleasant indeed. I'm a good deal relieved to hear you say that, Mr. Wappinger, she said because there was a possibility that you mightn't like it. Whether I like it or not, he said wearily, will depend upon your motive. I don't think you'll find any fault with that. I came because I thought I could help Dorothea. I hoped I might be able indirectly to help you, too. What makes you think we're in need of help? She came near enough for him to see her smile. Because until after you're married... You'll both be in an embarrassing position. There are worse things in the world than that. Not many. I can hardly imagine two people like Dorothea and yourself more awkwardly placed than you'll be from the minute she arrives. Remember, you're not Strephon and Chloe in a pastoral. 
your two most sophisticated members of a most sophisticated set. You scarcely know how to walk about, excepting according to the rules of a code of etiquette. Neither of you was made for escapade, and I'm sure you don't like it any more than she will. And so you've come to relieve the situation? Exactly. And for anything else? What else could I come for? You might have come for two or three things. One of which would be to interfere with your plans. Well, I haven't. If I wanted to do that, I could have done it long ago. I'll tell you outright that Mr. Prune requested me more than once to put a stop to your acquaintance with Dorothea, and I refused. I refused at first because I didn't think it wise, and afterward because I liked you. I kept on refusing because I came to see in the end that you were born to marry Dorothea, and that no one else would ever suit her. I am here this evening because I believe that still, and I want you to be happy. Did you think your coming would make us happier? In the long run, yes. You may not see it tonight, but you will tomorrow. You can't imagine that I would run the risk of forcing myself upon you unless I was sure there was something I could do. Well, what is it? It isn't much, and yet it's a great deal. When you and Dorothea are married, I want to go with you. I want to be there. I don't want to go friendless. When she goes back to town tomorrow and everything has to be explained, I want to be able to say that I was beside her. I know that mine is not a name to carry much authority, but I'm a woman. A woman who has held a position of responsibility, or as the mother's place, towards Dorothea herself. And there are moments in life when any kind of woman is better than none at all. You may not see it just now, but... Oh, yes, I do, he said slowly. Only when you've gone in for an unconventional thing, you might as well be hung for a sheep as a lamb. I don't agree with you. Nothing more than the unconventional requires a nicely discriminating taste. And it's no use being more violent than you can help. You and Dorothea are making a match that sets the rules of your world at defiance. But you may as well avail yourselves of any little mitigation that comes to hand. Life is going to be hard enough for you as it is. Oh, I don't know about that. They can't do anything to us. Not to you, perhaps, because you're a man. But they can't to Dorothea, and they will. This is just one of those queer situations in which you'll get the credit and she'll get the blame. You can always make a poem on young Lochinvar when it's less easy to approve of the damsel who springs to the pillion behind him. I don't pretend to account for this idiosyncrasy of human nature. I mean, it is as a fact. Society will forget that you ran away with Dorothea, but it will never forget that she ran away with you. Ha! Uh -huh. But I don't see that that need distress you. You wouldn't care. And as for Dorothea, she's got the pluck of a soldier. Depend upon it, she sees the whole situation already and is prepared to face it. That's part of the difference between a woman and a man. You can go into a thing like this without looking ahead, because you know that, whatever the opposition, you can keep it down. A woman is too weak for that. She must count every danger beforehand. Dorothea has done that. This isn't going to be a leap in the dark for her. It would be for any girl of her intelligence and social instincts. She knows what she's doing, and she's doing it for you. She has made her sacrifice and made it willingly before she consented to make, take this step at all. She's crossed her Rubicon without saying anything to you about it, and you needn't consider her any more. Well, I like that, he said in an injured tone, thrusting his hands into his overcoat pockets and beginning to move along the terrace. Yes, I thought you would, she agreed, walking by his side. It shows what she's willing to give up for you. It shows even more than that. It shows how she loves you. Dorothea is not a girl who holds society lightly. And if she renounces it... Oh, but come now, Mrs. Edrith. It isn't going to be as bad as that. It isn't going to be as bad as anything. Bad is not the word. When I speak of renouncing society, of course, I only mean renouncing the best. There will always be some people to... Well, you remember Dumas' comparison of the sixpenny and the six-shilling peaches. If you can't have the latter, you will be able to afford the former. They walked on in silence to the end of the terrace, and it was not till after they had turned that the young man spoke again. 
I believe you're overdrawing it, he said with some decision. Isn't it you who are overdrawing what I mean? I am simply trying to say that while things won't be very pleasant for you, they won't be worse than you can easily bear, especially when Dorothea has steeled herself to them in advance. I repeat, too, that, poor as I am, my presence will be taken as safeguarding some of the proprieties people expect one to observe. I speak of my presence, but after all, you may have provided yourself with someone better. I didn't think of that. No, there's no one. Then Dorothea is coming all alone? Uh, Reggie Bradford is bringing her, if you want to know. By the 10-5 train? No, in his motor. How very convenient these motors are. And has she no companion but Mr. Bradford? She hasn't any companion at all. She doesn't even know that the man driving the machine is Reggie. He thought that, going very slowly, as he promised to do, to avoid all chances of accident, they might arrive by eleven. And Dorothea was to be alone here with you two men? Well, you see, we are to be married as soon as she arrives. We go straight from here to the clergyman's house. He's waiting for us. In ten minutes' time, I shall be her husband, and then everything will be all right. How cleverly you've arranged it. I had to make my arrangements pretty close, Carly explained in a tone of pride. There were a good many difficulties to overcome, but I did it. Dorothea has had no trouble at all, and will have none. That is, he added with a sigh at the recollection of what Diana had just said, as far as getting down here is concerned. She went to tea at the Belfords, and on coming out, she found a motor waiting for her at the door. She walked into it without asking questions and sat down, and that's all. She doesn't know whose motor it is or where she's going, except that she's been taken toward me. I provided her with everything. She's got nothing to do but sit still she she gets here, when she will be married almost before she knows she's arrived. It's certainly most romantic, and if one has to do such things, they couldn't be done better. Well, one has to sometimes. Yes, so I see. What do you suppose Derek Prune will say? he asked, after a brief pause. I haven't the least idea what he'll say in these circumstances. Of course, I always knew, but there's no use speaking about that now. Speaking about what now? he asked sharply. Oh, nothing. One must be with Mr. Prune constantly, live in his house, to understand him. You can always count on his being kinder than he seems at first, or on the surface. During the last months I was with Dorothea, I could see plainly enough that in the end she would get her way. He paused abruptly in his walk and confronted her. Then for heaven's sake, he demanded, why didn't you tell me that before? You never asked me. I couldn't go around shouting it out for nothing. Besides, it was only my opinion, in which, after all, I am quite likely to be wrong. But quite likely to be right. I suppose so. Naturally, I should have told you, she went on humbly, if I thought that you wanted to hear, but how was I to know that? One doesn't talk about other people's private affairs unless one is invited. In any case, it doesn't matter now. A man who can cut the Gordian knot as you can doesn't care to hear that there's a way by which it might have been unravelled. I'm not so sure about that. There are cases in which the longest way round is the shortest way home, and if... But I didn't suppose you would consider so cautious a route as that. I shouldn't for myself, but you see, I have to think of Dorothea. But I've already told you that there's no occasion for that. If Dorothea has made her choice with her eyes open... Good Lord! He cried impatiently. You'd take it as if all I wanted was to get her into a noose. Well, isn't it? Perhaps I'm stupid. But I thought the whole reason for bringing her down here was because... Because we thought there was no other way, he finished in a tone of exasperation. But if there is another way... I'm not at all sure that there is, she retorted with a touch of asperity to keep pace with his rising emotion. Don't begin to think that because I said Mr. Prune was coming round to it... He's obliged to do it. No, but if there was a chance. Of course there are always that. But what then? Well, then there'd be no particular reason for rushing the thing tonight. But I don't know, though, he continued with a sudden change of tone. We're here, and perhaps we might as well go through with it. All I want is her happiness. And since she can't be happy in her own home... Diane laughed softly. 
and he stopped once more in his walk to look down at her. There's one thing you ought to understand about Dorothea, she said with a little air of amusement. You know how fond I am of her, and that I wouldn't criticise her for the world. Now don't be offended and don't glower at me like that, for I must say it. Dorothea isn't unhappy because she hasn't a good home, or because she has a stern father, or because she can't marry you. She's unhappy because she isn't getting her own way, and for no other reason whatever. She's the dearest, sweetest, most loving little girl on earth, but she has a will like steel. Whatever she sets her mind on, great or small, that she is determined to do, and when it's done, she doesn't care any more about it. When I was with her, I never crossed her in anything. I let her do what she was bent on doing, right up to the point where she saw herself that she didn't want to. If her father would only treat her like that, she... She wouldn't be coming down here tonight. That's what you mean, isn't it? Oh, no, how can you say so? I can say so because I think there's a good deal of truth in it. I'm not without some glimmering of insight into her character myself. And to be quite frank, it was seeing her set her pretty white teeth and clinch her fist and stamp her foot to get her way over nothing at all. First made me fall in love with her. Then I will say no more. I see you know her as well as I do. Yes, I know her, he said confidently, marching on again. I don't think there are many corners of her character into which I haven't seen. Several remarks arose to Diane's lips, but she repressed them, and they continued their walk in silence. During the three or four turns they took, side by side, up and down the terrace, she defined the course his thought was taking, and her speech was with his inner rather than his outer man. Suddenly he stopped with one of his jerky pauses, and when he spoke his voice took on a boyish quality that made it appealing. Mrs. Edith, do you know what I think? I think that you and I have come down here on what looks like a fool's business. If it wasn't for leaving Dorothea here with Reggie Bradford, I'd put you in the motor, and we'd travel back to New York as fast as tyres could take us. Upon my word, she confessed, you make me almost wish we could do it. But of course it isn't possible. There must be someone here to, to meet Dorothea and, and explain. I could do that if you liked. Oh, no, he exclaimed with a new change of mind. I should look as if I was showing the white feather. On the contrary, you'd look as if you knew what it was to be a man. And Derek Prune might hold out against me in the end. It would be time enough even then to do what you meant to do tonight, and I'd help you. He hesitated still, till another thought occurred to him. Oh, what's the good? It's too late to rectify anything now. They must know at her house by this time that she's got to meet me. No, I've anticipated that. They understand that she's here, at the Bay Tree Inn, with me. He moved away from her with a quick backward leap. With you? You've done that? You've seen them? You've told them? You're a wonderful woman, Mrs. Edith. I see now what you've been up to, he added with a shrill, nervous laugh. You've been turning me round your little finger, and I'm hanged if you haven't done it very cleverly. You've failed in this one point, however, but you haven't done it quite cleverly enough. I stay. Very well, but you won't refuse to let me stay, too, for the reasons that I gave you at first. You're wily, I must say. If you can't get best, you're willing to take second best, isn't that it? That's it, exactly. I did hope that no marriage would take place between Dorothea and you tonight. I hoped that before you came to that, you'd realise to what a degree you're taking advantage of her willfulness and her love for you, for it's a mixture of both to put her in a false position, in which she'll never wholly free herself as long as she lives. I hoped you'd be man enough to go back and win her from her father by open means. Failing all that, I hoped you'd let me blunt the keenest edge of your folly by giving to your marriage the countenance which my presence at it could bestow. Was there any harm in that? Was there anything for you to resent, or, or for me to be ashamed of? Is a good thing less good because I wish it? or a wife thought less wise because I think it? You talk of turning you round my little finger as though it was something at which you had to take offence. My dear boy, that only shows how young you are. Every good woman, if I might call myself one, turns the men she cares for round her little finger. 
and it's the men who are worth most in life who submit most readily to the process. When you're a little older, when perhaps you have children of your own, you'll understand better what I've done for you tonight. And he won't use towards my memory the tone of semi-jocular disdain that has entered into nearly every word you've addressed to me this evening. Now, if you'll excuse me, she added wearily, I think I'll go in. I'm very tired, and I'll rest till Dorothea comes. When she arrives, she must bring her to me directly, and she must stay with me till I take her to the wedding. My room is the first door on the left of the main entrance. She was halfway across the terrace when he called out to her, the boyish tremor in his voice more accentuated than before. Wait a minute. There's lots of time. She came back a few paces towards him. Shouldn't I look very grotesque if I hooked it? Not half so grotesque as you'll look tomorrow morning when you have to go back to town and tell everyone you meet that you and Dorothea Prune have run away and got married. That's when you'll look foolish and cut a pathetic figure. As things are, it could be kept between two or three of us. But if you go on, you'll be in all the papers by tomorrow afternoon. Of course your mother knows. I suppose so. I wired when I thought it was too late for her to spread the alarm. But I don't mind about her. She'll be the only be too glad to have me back at any price. Then I'd go. The light from the hotel was full on his face, and you could almost have kissed him for his doleful, crestfallen expression. Well, I will. There was no heroism in the way in which he said the words, and the spring disappeared from his walk as he went back to the hotel to pay his bill and order out his machine. Diane smiled to her herself to see how his head drooped and his shoulders sagged, but her eyes blinked at the mist that rose before them. After all, he was little more than a schoolboy, and he and Dorothea were but two children at play. She did not continue her own way into the hotel. Now that the first part of her purpose in coming had been accomplished, she was free to remember what the comedy with Carney had almost excluded from her mind. But within an hour or two, Derek Prune and she might be face to face again. The thought made her heart leap as with sudden fright. Fortunately, Dorothy would have arrived by that time and would stand between them. Otherwise, the mere possibility would have been overwhelming. Yes, Dorothy ought to be coming soon. She looked at her watch and found it was nearly eleven. On the stillness of the night there came a sound, a clatter, a whiz, a throb, the unmistakable noise of an automobile. She hurried to the end of the terrace, but it was not Dorothea coming, it was Carly going away. She breathed more freely, standing to see him pass, and knowing that he was really gone. A minute later he went by in the moonlight, waving his hand to her, as she stood silhouetted on the terrace above him. Then, to her annoyance, the motor stopped and he leaped out. For a moment her heart stood still in alarm, for if he was coming back, the work might be to do all over again. He did not come back, scrambling up the steps till he was at her feet. But it was only to seize her hand and kiss it hastily, after which, without a word, he was off again. Then once more the huge machine clattered and whizzed and throbbed, rattling its way down the drive and on into the dark, till all sound died away into the solemn winter silence. End of chapter 20。Chapter 21 of The Inner Shrine by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 21. During the next half hour, small practical tasks occupied Diane's mind and kept the thought of Derek Prune's arrival from becoming more than a subconscious dread. She informed the manager of her success with his mysterious young guest and arranged that Dorothea, when she came, should spend the night with her. Then she put herself in telephonic communication, first with Mrs. Wappinger and then with Fulton. She gave the informer the intelligence that Carly had departed and received from the latter the information that Simmons had found his master, who had been able to leave for Lakefield by the 10-5 train. 
These steps being taken, there was nothing to do but to, to sit down and wait for Dorothea. Allowing thirty or forty minutes for possible delays, she calculated that the girl ought to arrive a good half hour before her father. This would give her time to deal with each separately, clearing up misunderstandings on both sides and preparing the way for such a meeting as would lead to mutual concessions and future peace. Physically tired, she took off her hat and threw herself on the couch in her little sitting room. By sheer force of will, she continued to shut out Derek from her thought, concentrating all her mental facilities on the arguments and persuasions she should bring to bear on Dorothea. She had no nervousness on this account. The naughty, headstrong child that runs away from home does not get far without a realising sense of its happy shelter. She divined that the long ride through the dark with an unknown man toward an unknown goal would have already subdued Dorothea's spirits to the point where she would be only too glad to find herself dropping into familiar feminine arms. At eleven o'clock she got up from her couch with a vague impulse to be in a more direct attitude of welcome. At half past eleven she went to the office to inquire of the manager how long a motor going slowly should take to reach Lakefield from New York, assuming that it had got away from the city about six o'clock. Alarmed by his reply, she begged him to keep a certain number of the servants up and the hotel in readiness to cope with any emergency or accident, promising liberal remuneration for all unusual work. After that came another long hour of waiting. It was half-past twelve when there was a sound of a carriage coming up the driveway. It was probably Derrick, and yet there was a possibility that, the automobile having broken down, Reggie and Dorothea had been obliged to finish their journey in a humbler way than that in which they had started. Diane hurried to the terrace. The moon had disappeared, but the stars were out, and the night had grown colder. The pines surrounding the hotel shot up weirdly against the midnight sky, sighing with a low murmur like the moan of a primeval nature. Up the ascent from the main road the carriage crept wearily, while Diane's heart poured itself out in a sort of incoherent prayer that Dorothea might have arrived before her father. The horses dragged themselves to the steps, and Derek Prue sprang out. Instinctively Diane fell back. Oh, it's you, she gasped, unable for the instant to say more. Yes, he returned quickly, peering down into her face. What news? Dorothea hasn't come. The the other person has gone. Gone? How gone? He went away of his own accord. That is, you sent him? Not exactly. He was willing to go. He, he saw he'd been doing wrong. A porter having come from the hotel and seized Derek's valise, it was necessary for them to go in and attend to the small preliminaries of arrival. When they were finished, Derek returned to Diane, who had seated herself in a wicker chair beside one of the numerous tea tables to which a large part of the hall was given up. Under the eye of the drowsy clerk, who still kept his place at the office desk, she felt a certain sense of protection, even though the width of the hotel lay between them. Now tell me, Derek said in his quick commanding tones, tell me everything. The repressed intensity of his bearing had on Diane the effect of making her more calmly mistress of herself. Quietly, and in a manner as matter-of-fact as she could make it, she told her tale from the beginning. She narrated her summons from Mrs. Wappinger, her visit to his own house, her arrangements there, her journey to Lakefield, and her interview with Carly Wappinger. Without making light of what he and Dorothea had undertaken to do, she reduced their faults to a minimum, turning it into indiscretion rather than anything more grave. She laid stress on the excellence of the young man's character, as well as on the promptness with which he had relinquished his part in the plan as soon as he saw its true nature. In spite of himself, Derek began to think of the lad as of one who had sprung to his help in a moment of need, and to whom he was indebted for a service. Not until Diane ceased speaking was he able to brush this absurd impression away, and the knowledge that Dorothea should have arrived nearly two hours ago, was still out in the dark. That, for the moment, was the one fact to which everything else was subordinate. I can't understand it, he said nervously. If they left New York by six or even seven, they should have been here by eleven at the latest. 
That would have given them time for slow going or taking a circuitous route. He rose nervously from his seat, interviewed the clerk at the desk, went out on the terrace, listened in the silence, walked restlessly up and down, and, returning to Diane, enumerated the different possibilities that would reasonably account for the delay. Glad of this preoccupation, since it diverted thought from their more personal relations, she pointed out the wisdom of accepting whatever explanation was least grave, until they knew the certainty. When he had gone out several times more to listen on the terrace, he came back, and resuming his seat, said brusquely, You look tired. You ought to get some rest. The tone of intimate care reached Diane's heart more directly than words of greater import. I would, she said simply. That is, I'd go to my room if I thought you'd be kind to Dorothea when she came. And don't you think so? I think you'd want to be, she smiled, if you knew how. But I shouldn't know how. You see, it's a situation that calls directly for a woman, and you're so essentially a man. When Dorothea arrives, she won't be a headstrong runaway girl. She'll be a poor little terrified child, frightened to death at what she has done, and wanting nothing so much as to creep sobbing into her mother's arms and be comforted. If you could only... I'll do anything you tell me. It's no use telling, you have to know. It's a case in which you must act by instinct, and not by rule of thumb. In her eagerness to have something to say which would keep conversation away from dangerous themes, she spoke exhaustively on the subject of parental tact, holding well to the thread of her topic, until she perceived that he was not so much listening to what she said as thinking of her. But she had gained her point, and led him to see that Dorothea was to be treated leniently, which was sufficient for the moment. Now, she finished rising, I think I'll take your advice and go and rest till she comes. That's my door, just opposite. I chose the room for its convenience in receiving Dorothea. You'll be sure to call me, won't you, the minute you hear the sound of wheels? He had sat gazing up at her, but now he too rose. It was a minute at which their common anxiety regarding Dorothea slipped temporarily into the background allowing the main question at issue between them to assert itself. But it asserted itself silently. He had meant to speak, but he could only look. She had meant to withdraw, but she remained to return his look, with the lingering, quiet, steady gaze which time and place and circumstance seemed to make the most natural mode of expression for the things that were vital between them. What passed thus defied all analysis of thought, as well as all utterance in language, but it was understood by each in his or her own way. To her, it was the greeting and farewell of souls in different spheres, who again pass one another in space. For him, it was the dumb, stifled cry of nature, the claim of a heart demanding its rightful place in another heart, the protest of love that has been debarred from its return by a cruel cold of morals, a preposterous convention, grown suddenly meaningless, to a woman like her, and to a man like him. Something like this it would have been a relief to him to cry out, had not the strong hand of custom been upon him, and forced him to say that which was far below the pressure of his yearning. This isn't the time to talk about what I owe you, he said, feeling the insufficiency of his words. It's too much to be disposed of in a few phrases. On the contrary, you owe me nothing at all. We'll not dispute the point now. No, but I'd rather not leave you under a misapprehension. If I've done anything tonight, been of any use at all, it's been simply because I loved Dorothea, and, and it was right. When it was in my power, I couldn't have refused to do it for anyone. For anyone, you understand? Oh, yes, I understand perfectly. But anyone in the same circumstances would feel as I do. No. Not as I do, he corrected quickly. No one else in the world could feel. I'm really very tired, she said hurriedly. I'll go now, but I count on you to call me. He watched her while she glided across the room, but it was only when her door had closed and he had dropped into his seat that he was able to state to himself the fact that the mere sight of her again had demolished all the barricades he'd been building in his heart against her for the last six months. They had fallen more easily than the walls of Jericho at the blast of the sacred horn. 
inflection of her voice, the look from her eyes, the gestures of her hands, had dispelled them into nothingness, like ramparts of mist. But it was not that alone. He was too much a man of affairs not to give credit to the practical abilities she had shown that night. No graces of person or charms of mind or resources of courage could have called forth his admiration more effectively than this display of prosaic executive capacity. What had to be done, she had done, more promptly, wisely and easily than any man could have accomplished it. She had foreseen possibilities and forestalled accident with a thoroughness which he himself could not have equalled. My God! he groaned inwardly. What a wife she would have made for any man! How oh, I could have loved her if it hadn't been for... He stopped abruptly and leaped to his feet, looking around dazed on the great empty hall, at the end of which a porter slept in his chair, while the clerk blinked drowsily behind his desk. I do love her, he declared to himself. All summer long I have uttered blasphemies. I do love her. Whatever she may have been, she shall be my wife. Out on the terrace, the cold wind was grateful, and he stood for a minute bareheaded, letting it blow over his fevered face and through his hair. It had risen during the last hour, making the pines rock slowly in the starlight and swelling their moan into deep sobs. As Derek Prune paced the terrace in strained expectation, he was deceived again and again into the thought that something was approaching. Now it was the champing and stamping of horses toiling up the ascent. Now it was the bray and throb of the automobile. Now it was the voices of men conversing or calling or breaking into laughter. Twenty times he hastened to the steps at the end of the terrace, sure he could not have been mistaken, only to hear the earth horses sob and sigh and shout again, as if in derision of this puny, presumptuous mortal with his evanescent joy and pain. So another hour passed. His mind was not of the imaginative order which invents disaster in moments of suspense, so that he was able to keep his watch more patiently than many another might have done. Once he tried to smoke, but the mere scent of tobacco seemed out of place in this curious world, alive with odd psychical suggestions, and he threw the cigar away into the darkness, where its light glowed reproachfully like a dying eye, till it went out. It was after three when a sudden sound from the driveway struck his ear, but he had been deceived so often that he would pay it no attention. Though it seemed like the unmistakable approach of an automobile, it had seemed so before, and he would not even look round till he had reached the distant end of the terrace. When he turned, he could see through the trees and along the dark line of the avenue the advance of the heralding light. Dorothea had come at last. She was even close upon them. In a few more seconds she would be alighting at the steps. He hurried inside to wake the porter and warn Diane. She's here, he called, rapping sharply at her door. Please come, quick. There was a response and a hurried movement from within, but he did not wait for her to appear. When she came out of her room she could see from the light thrown over the terrace that the motor had already stopped at the steps. Someone was getting out, and she could hear men's voices. Advancing to a spot midway between her room and the main entry, she stood waiting for Derek to bring her his daughter. A moment later, he sprang into the light of the doorway with the features white and alarmed. Go back, he cried to her with a commanding gesture. Go back. But what's the matter? Go back, he ordered more imperiously than before. Oh, Derek, it's Dorothea. She's hurt. I must go to her. I will not go back. She rushed towards the entry, but he caught her and pushed her back. I tell you, you must go back, he repeated. It's Dorothea, she's cried. She's hurt. She's killed. Let me go. She needs me. It isn't Dorothea, he whispered, forcing her over the threshold of her own room, and trying to close the door upon her. Then what is it? she begged. Tell me now. You're hurting me. Let me go. You're killing me. It's... But there was no need to say more, for the main door swung open again, and the Marquis de Bienville entered followed by a porter carrying his valise. At his appearance, Derek relinquished Diane's hand, and Diane herself was so astonished that she stepped plainly into view. Not less astonished than herself, Mierville stopped, stock still, looked at her, looked into the room behind her, 
looked at Derrick with a long, half-amused, comprehending stare, lifted his hat gravely, and passed on. When he had gone, there was a minute of dead silence. With parted lips and awe-stricken eyes, Diane gazed after him till he had spoken to the clerk at the desk and passed on into the darker recesses of the hotel. When she turned toward Derrick, he was smiling, but what she knew was an effort to treat the situation lightly. Well, this time we've given him something to talk about, he laughed bravely. She shrugged her shoulders and spread apart her hands with one of her habitual fatalistic gestures. I don't mind. He can't do me more harm than he's done already. It's not of him that I'm thinking, but of Dorothea. She hasn't come. No, she hasn't come. The fact had grown alarming so much so as to make the incident of Beauville's appearance seem in comparison a matter of little moment. Diane remained on the threshold of her room, and Derrick in the hall outside, while, for mutual encouragement, they rehearsed once more the list of predicaments in which the young people might have found themselves without serious danger. Diane was about to withdraw, when a man ran down the hall, calling, the, the telephone for the gentleman! Derrick started on a run. Diane followed more slowly. When she reached the office, Derrick had the receiver to his ear and was talking. Yes, Fulton. Go on. I hear. Who was running you up? I, I didn't catch. Miss... Oh, Miss Marion Gribston. Yes. In Philadelphia at the Hotel Belleville. Yes. I understand. And Miss Dorothea is with her. Good. Did she say how she got there? We'll explain when we get back to New York tomorrow morning. All right. Yeah, yes, to lunch. She said Miss Dorothea was quite well and satisfied with her trip. That's good. Well, good night, Fulton. Sorry to have kept you up. He put up the receiver and turned to Diane. Did you understand? Perfectly. I think I know what has happened. I can guess. Then I'll be hanged if I can. What is it? I'll let them tell you that themselves. I'm too tired to say anything more tonight. She kept close to the office where the clerk was shutting books and locking drawers preparatory to closing. You must let me come and thank you, he began. You must thank Miss Marianne Grimston, she interrupted, for any real service. All I've done for you, as you see, has been to bring you on an unnecessary journey. For me it has been a journey into truth. I'll say good night now. I shall not see you in the morning. You'll not forget to be very gentle with Dorothea, will you? And with him. Good night again. Good night. Smiling into his eyes, she ignored the hand he held out to her and slipped away into the semi-darkness as the impatient clerk began turning out the lights. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of The Inner Shrine by Basil King. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evans. Chapter 22. Dega Prune was guilty of an injustice to the Marquis de Bienville in supposing he would make the incident at Lakefield a topic of conversation among his friends. His sense of honour alone would have kept him from betraying what might be looked upon as an involuntary confidence even if it had not better suited his purposes to entrust the matter in the form of an amusing anecdote told under the seal of secrecy to Mrs. Bayford. In her hands it was like invested capital, adding to itself, while he did nothing at all. Months of insinuation on his part would have failed to achieve the result that she brought about in a few days' time, with no more effort than a rose makes in shedding perfume. Before Derrick had been able to recover from the feeling of having passed through a strange waking dream, before Dorothea and he had resumed the orbit tenor of their life together, before he had seen Diane again, he was given to understand that the little scene on Bienville's arrival at the Baytree Inn was familiar matter in the offices, banks and clubs he most frequented. The intelligence was conveyed by a score of trivial signs, suggestive, satirical or over-familiar, which he would not have perceived in days gone by, but to which he had grown sensitive. It was clear that the story gained piquancy from its contrast with the staidness of his life, and his most intimate friends permitted themselves a little covert chaff with him on the event. 
He was not of a nature to resent this raillery on his own account. It was serious to him only because it touched Diane. For her, the matter was so grave that he exhausted his ingenuity in devising means for her protection. He refrained from even seeing her until he could go with some ultimatum before which she should be obliged to yield. An unsuccessful appeal to her, he judged, would be worse than none at all, and until he discovered arguments which he could not controvert, he decided to hold his peace. Action of some sort became imperative when he found that Miss Lucilla Van Tromp had heard the story and drawn from it what seemed to her the obvious conclusion. I should never have believed it, she declared tearfully, if you hadn't admitted it yourself. I told Mrs. Baver that nothing but your own words would convince me that any such scene had taken place. Allowing that it did, isn't it conceivable that it might have had an honourable motive? Then what is it? If you could tell me that... I could tell you easy enough if there weren't other considerations involved. I should think that in the circumstances you could trust me. Nobody else does, Derek. Whom do you mean by nobody else? Mrs. Bayford? Oh, she's not the only one. If your men friends don't believe in you... They believe in me, all right. Don't you worry about that. They may believe in you as men believe in one another, but it isn't the way I believe in people. I know how you believe in people, if ill-natured women would let you alone. You wouldn't mistrust a thief if you saw him stealing your watch from your pocket. That's not true, Derek. I can be as suspicious as anyone when I like. Well, don't you see that your suspicion doesn't only light on me? It strikes Diane. That's just it. Lucilla, he cried reproachfully. Well, Derek, you know how loyal I've been to her. It's been harder, too, than you've ever been aware of. What I haven't told you, I wouldn't tell you, one half the thing that people have hinted to me during the past two years. Yes, but who are a lot of jealous women? It's no use saying that, Derek, because your own actions contradict you. Why did Diane leave your house if it wasn't that you believed? Don't. He raised his hand to his face as if protecting himself from a blow. I wouldn't, she cried, if you didn't make me. I say it only in self-defence. After all, you can only accuse me of what you've done yourself. Dan made me think at first that you had misjudged her. But I see now that if she had been a good woman, you wouldn't have sent her away. I didn't send her away. She went. Yes, Teddy, but why? That has nothing to do with the question of the discussion. On the contrary, it has everything to do with it. It all belongs together. I've loved Diana and defended her, but I've come to the point where I can't do it any longer. After what's happened... But I tell you, what happened is nothing. If it was only right for me to explain it to you, as I'll explain it to you some day, you'd find you owed her a debt that you could never could repay. Very well, I won't dispute it. It still doesn't affect the main point at issue. Can you yourself, Derek, honestly and truthfully affirm that you look upon Diana as a good woman, in the sense that is usually attached to the words? I can honestly and truthfully affirm that I look upon her as one of the best women in the world. That isn't the point. Louise de la Valliere became one of the best women in the world, but there are some other things that might be said of her. But I'll not argue, I'll not insist. Since you think I'm wrong, I'll take your own word for it, Derek. Just tell me once, tell me without quibble, and on your honour as my cousin and a gentleman, that you believe Diane to be what I've supposed her to be hitherto, and what you know very well I mean, and I'll not doubt it further. For a moment he stood speechless, trying to formulate the lie he could utter most boldly, and then he was struck with the double thought that to defend Diane's honour with a falsehood would be to, to defame it further, while a lie to this pure, trusting, virginal spirit would be a crime. Tell me, Derek, she insisted. Tell me, and I'll believe you. He retreated a place or two, as if trying to get out of her presence. I'm listening, Derek. Go on. I'm willing to take your word. Then I repeat, he said weakly, that I believe her, I, I know her, to be one of the best women in the world. Like Louise de la Valliere? Yes, he shouted, maddened to the retort. Like Louise de la Valliere, and what then? He stood as if demanding a reply. Nothing. I have no more to say. Then I have, and I'll ask you to listen. He drew near to her again and spoke slowly. There were doubtless many good women in Jerusalem in the time of Herod and Pilate and Christ. 
but not the least held in honour among us today, is the Magdalene. That's one thing. And there's something more. There is joy, so we are told, in the presence of the angels of God, plenty of it, let us hope. But it isn't over the ninety and nine just persons who need no repentance. So much as over the one poor, deserted, lonely sinner that repenteth. That repenteth, Lucilla, do you hear? You know whom I mean. With this, as his confession of faith, he left her to go in search of Diane. He had formed the ultimatum before which, as he believed, she should find herself obliged to surrender. It was a day on which Diane's mood was one of comparative peace. She was engrossed in an occupation which at once soothed her spirits and appealed to her taste. Madame Cochet, the landlady, bewailing the continued illness of her lingere, Diana begged her to be allowed to take charge of the linen room of the hotel, not merely as a means of earning a living, but because she delighted in such work. Methodical in her habits and nimble with her needle, the neatness, smoothness and purity of piles of white damask stirred all those housewifely, home-keeping instincts which are so largely a part of every Frenchwoman's nature. Her fingers busy with the quiet, delicate task of mending, her mind could dwell with the greater content on such subjects as she had for satisfaction. They were more numerous than they had been for a long time past. The meeting at Lakefield had changed her mental attitude towards Jerry Prune, taking a large part of the pain out of her thoughts of him, as well as out of his thoughts of her. She had avoided seeing him after that one night, and she had heard nothing from him since. But she knew it was impossible for him to go on thinking of her altogether harshly. She had been useful to him. She had saved Dorothea from a great mistake. She had done it in such a way that no hint of the escapade was likely to become known outside of the few who had taken part in it. She had put herself in a relation towards him, which, as a final one, was much to be preferred to that which had existed before. She could therefore pass out of his life more satisfied than she had dared hoped to be with the effect that she had had upon it. As she stitched, she sighed to herself with a certain comfort. When, glancing up, she saw him standing at the door. The nature of her thoughts, coupled with his sudden appearance, drew to her lips a quiet smile. They shouldn't have shown you in here, she protested gently letting her work fall to her lap, but not rising from her place. I insisted, he explained briefly from the threshold. You can come in, she smiled, as he continued to stand at the doorway. You can even sit down. She pointed to a chair not far from her own, going on again with her stitching, so as to avoid the necessity for further greeting. I suppose you wonder what I'm doing, she pursued when he had seated himself. I'm not wondering at that so much as whether you ought to be doing it. I can relieve your mind on that score. It's a case, too, in which duty and pleasure jump together. The delight of handling beautiful linen is like nothing else in the world. It seems to me like servant's work, he said bluntly. Possibly, but I can do servant's work at a pinch, especially when I like it. I don't, he declared. But then you don't have to do it. I mean that I don't like it for you. Even so, you wouldn't forbid my doing it, would you? I wish I had the right to. I've come here this afternoon to ask you again if you won't give it to me. For a few minutes, she stitched in silence. When she spoke, it was without stopping her work or lifting her head. I'm sorry that you should raise that question again. I thought it was settled. Supposing it was, it can be reopened, if there's a reason. But there is none. That's all you know about it. There's a very important reason. Since when? Since Lakefield. Do you mean anything that Monsieur de Bienville may have said? I do. That wouldn't be a reason for me. But you don't know. I can imagine... Monsieur de Bienville has already done me all the harm he can. It's beyond his power to hurt me any more. But, Diane, you don't know what you're saying. You don't know what he's doing. He's... I hardly know how to put it. He's, he's destroying your reputation. 
She glanced up with a smile, ceasing for an instant to stare. You mean he's destroying what's left of it? Well, he's welcome. There was so little of it. For God's sake, Diane, don't say that. It breaks my heart. You must consider the position that you put me in. After you've rendered me one of the greatest services one person could do another, do you think I can sit quietly by while you are being robbed of the dearest thing in life, just because you did it? I should be sorry to think the opinion other people hold of me to be the dearest thing in life. But even if it were, I'd willingly give it up for Dorothea. It isn't for Dorothea. It's for me. Well, wouldn't you let me do it for you? I'm not of much use in the world, but it would make me a little happier to think I could do anyone a good turn without being promised a reward. A reward? Oh, Diane! It's what you're offering me, isn't it? If it hadn't been for, for the great service you speak about, you wouldn't be here asking me again to be your wife. That's your way of putting it, but I'll put it in mine. If it hadn't been for the magnitude of the sacrifice you're willing to make for me, I shouldn't have dared to hope that you loved me. When all pretexts and secondary causes have been considered and thrust aside, that, that's why I'm here, and for no other reason whatever. If you love me, he continued, why should you hesitate any longer? If you love me, why seek for reasons to justify the simple prompting of your heart? What have you and I got to do with other people's opinions? When there's a plain, straightforward course before us, why not go right on and follow it? She raised her eyes for one brief glance. You forget. The words were spoken quietly, but they startled him. Yes, Diane, I do forget. Rather, there's nothing left for me to remember. I know what you'd have me recall. I'll speak of this once more to be silent on the subject forever. I want you to forgive me. I want to tell you that I, too, have repented. Repented of what? Of the wrong I've done you. I believe your soul to be as white as all this whiteness around you. Then, she continued, questioning gently, you've changed your point of view during the last six months? I have. You charge me, then, with being willing to come down to your level. Now I'm asking you to let me climb up to it. I see that I was a self-righteous Pharisee, and that the true man is he who could smite his breast and say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. A sinner? Like me? I don't want to be led into further explanations, he said suddenly on his guard against insinuations. You and I have said too much to each other not to be able to be frank. Now, I've been frank enough. You've understood what I've felt at other times. You, you understand what I feel today. Why draw me out to make me speak more plainly? I'm not drawing you out, she declared. If I asked you a question or two, it was to show you that not even the woman that you take me for, not even the forgiven penitent, could be a good wife for you. I can't marry you, Mr. Prune. I must beg you to let that answer be decisive. There was decision in the way in which she folded her work and smoothed the white brocaded surface in her lap. There was decision, too, in the quickness with which he rose and stood looking down at her. For a second she expected him to turn from her, as he had turned once before, and leave her with no explanation beyond a few laconic words. She held her breath while she awaited them. Then that means, he said at last, that you put me in the position of taking all, while you give all. I don't put you into any position whatsoever. The circumstances are not of my making. They are as much beyond my control as they are beyond yours. They're not wholly beyond mine. If there are some things I can't do, there are some I can prevent. What things? His tone alarmed her, and she struggled to her feet. You're willing to make me a great sacrifice, but at least I can refuse to accept it. What do you mean? She moved slightly back from him, behind the protection of one of the tables piled breast-high from its white load. You're willing to lose for me the last vestige of your good name. I don't care anything about that, she said hurriedly. But I do. I won't let you. How can you stop me? she asked, staring at him with large, frightened eyes. 
I shall tell Dorothea's part of the story. You would... She began with a questioning cry. All who care to hear it shall. They shall know it from its beginning to its end. They shall lose no detail of her folly or of your wisdom. You would sacrifice your child like that? Yes, like that. Neither she nor I can remain so indebted to anyone as you would have us be to you. You wouldn't be indebted to me? Not to so terrible an extent. If it's a choice between your good name and hers, hers must go. She'd agree with me herself. She wouldn't hesitate for one single fraction of an instant, if she knew. She'd be grateful to you as I am, but she couldn't profit by your magnanimity. So that the alternative you offer me is this. I can protect myself by sacrificing Dorothea, or I can marry you and Dorothea will be saved. I shouldn't express it in just those words, but it's something like it. Then I'll marry you. You give me a choice of evils, and I take the least. Oh, then to marry me would be an evil. What else do you make it? You'll admit that it's a little difficult to keep pace with you. You come to me one day accusing me of sin, and on another announcing my contrition. While on the third you may be in some entirely different mood about me. You can easily render me ridiculous. That's due to my awkwardness of expression, and not to anything wrong in the way I feel. Oh, but isn't it out of the heart that the mouth speaketh? I think so. You've advanced some excellent reasons why I should become your wife, and I can see that you're quite capable of believing them. At one time it was because I needed a home, at another because I needed protection, while today, I understand, it is because I love you. Is this fair? I dare say you think it isn't that you haven't been tried and judged half a dozen times unheard as I've been. I'll confess that you've shown the most wonderful ingenuity in trying to get me into a position where I should be obliged to marry you, whether I would or not. And now you've succeeded. Whether the game is worth the candle or not is for you to judge. My part is limited to saying that you've won. I'm ready to marry you as soon as you tell me when. To save Dorothea. To save Dorothea. And for no other reason? For no other reason. And of course I can't keep you to your word. You can't release me from it except on one condition. Which is? That Dorothea's secret shall be kept. I must use my own judgment about that. On the contrary, you must use mine. You've made me a proposal which I'm ready to accept. As a man of honour, you must hold to it, or be silent. Possibly, he admitted on reflection. I shall have to think it over. But in that case, we'll be just where we were. Yes, yeah, just where we were. And you'd be without help or protection. That's the thought I can't endure, Diane. Try to be just to me. If I make mistakes, if I flounder about, if I say things that offend you, it's because I can't rest while you're exposed to danger. Alone as you are in this great city, surrounded by people who are not your friends, are prey to criticism and misapprehension, but it is no worse, it's as if I saw you flung into the arena among the beasts. Any wonder that I want to stand by you? Can you be surprised if I demand the privilege of clasping you in my arms and saying to the world, this is my wife? When Christian women were thrown to the lions, there was once a heathen husband who leaped into the rim to die at his wife's side. Because he could do no more. That's my impulse. Only I could save you from the lions. I couldn't protect you against everything, perhaps, but I could against the worst. I know I'm stupid. I know I'm dull. When I come near you, I'm like the clown who touches some exquisite tissue spun of azure. But I'm like the clown who would fight for his treasure and defend it from sacrilegious hands and, and spend his last drop of love blood to keep it pure. It's to be put in a position where I can't do that, that I fight hard. It's to see you so defenceless. But I'm not defenceless. Why not? Whom would have you? Nobody, nobody in this world but me. Oh, yes, I have. Who? He smiled faintly at the fierceness of his brief question. Is no one to whom you need feel any opposition? 
even though it's someone who can do for me what you cannot. What I cannot? What you cannot? What no man can? Asperges me hisopo et mundabo. Thou shalt purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Eric, he has purged me with hyssop, even though he has not been in the way you think. The hyssop of what I've had to suffer, he has purged me from so many things, that now I can see I can safely commit my cause to him. So that you don't need me. She looked at him in silence before she replied, Not for defence. Nor for anything else? She tried to speak, but her voice failed her. Nor for anything else? He asked again. Her voice was faint, her head sank, her body trembled. But she forced the one word. No. End of chapter 22